Chapter Eleven of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven The Back Room at Jerry's. The taxi drew up to the curb. Billy Kane's hat was far over his eyes as he stepped out. He stood for an instant debating with himself, then handed the chauffeur another bill. What might happen at Jerry's, he did not know. He was going in blind again but as a means of retreat a taxi waiting around the corner would at least add to his chances if necessity arose, and a chauffeur well paid was a guarantee of fidelity than which there was none better. "'You've struck a gold mine tonight,' he said coolly. "'I may be gone half an hour, or I may be gone an hour. Wait for me.' "'You bet your life I'll wait,' said the chauffeur fervently. "'Oi!' Billy Kane was hurrying down the street. He turned the first corner and headed uh, along the intersecting street that was dark, narrow, and deserted. He passed another cross street and thereafter counted the houses as he went along. Here tenements and the old-fashioned dwellings of New York's early days incongruously rubbed shoulders with one another. Jerry's, he found, was the fifth house from the cross street. There was no mistaking Jerry's. It was one of the old private dwellings, and it had been pointed out to him more than once. He returned to the cross street, turned down it, slipped into the lane that passed in the rear of the houses he had just inspected from the front, and guardedly now, making his way silently along, he again counted the buildings that here in the darkness loomed up like black, uncouth shapes against the skyline. He stopped in the rear of the fifth house. Here and there a thread of light showed from a window, but it was a steady light a light that played truant through the interstices of closed shutters, or seeped, perhaps, through the folds of curtains hanging inadvertently awry. It was abnormally dark, and in the darkness there seemed to lurk a somber secrecy like a pall cloaking evil things. Billy Kane swung himself up and over a high fence and dropped noiselessly to the ground on the other side. He found himself in a yard that, even in the darkness, he could make out was strangely restricted in area. A few feet in front of him was the wall of the building itself. He crept forward, skirting along this wall. There was no window, but opening almost on a level with the ground were shuttered French doors. He continued on, rounded the angle of the building, and suddenly stooped down in a crouching posture. There was a window here just above his head, and from it came a meager gleam of light. His eyes grown accustomed to the darkness, he could distinguish his surroundings a little more clearly now. The yard here, a narrow strip of it paralleling the side fence, seemed to run back quite a distance, taking up a jut in the building. They had puzzled him, those shuttered French doors, where logically he had expected to find an ordinary back door and porch, but it was obvious now that the back room at Jerry's was an addition that had been built onto the house, extending almost to the fence in the rear. The window beneath which he crouched was shoulder high. He straightened up. The light came through slightly parted, heavy portieres. He felt the blood quicken suddenly in his veins. He could see in quite well. There were two men in the room, Carlin, and another man whom he did not recognize. The room was luxurious, if somewhat garishly furnished. A green baize card table, with several unopened packs of cards upon it, stood in the center. There was a blue and gold Chinese rug with a huge dragon pattern upon the floor, and at one side a large buffet groaned under a load of wine and whiskey bottles, bowls of fruit, and refreshments of various descriptions. The two men were talking earnestly. Carlin pulled out his watch and scowled. Billy Kane's lips tightened. He could see, but he could not hear. He took his penknife from his pocket and slipped the blade under the window sill. If he had luck, the window was not locked. He ah his breath came in a soft, long drawn intake. The window gave slightly under a cautious pressure. An inch was all that was necessary, half an inch even. The window went up by infinitesimal fractions of that inch. Billy Kane returned the penknife to his pocket. He could hear them now. Carlin was speaking, and the other man, it appeared now, was the proprietor of the place, Jerry the ex-croupier of Monte Carlo. "'What's the matter with you, Jerry, getting nervous waiting?' said Carlin curtly. "'Well, forget it. This is the rat's plan, and that ought to be good enough. What? Nothing is going wrong. Nothing can go wrong. Certainly the police will close you up for a month, but that's all there is to it so far as you are concerned. 
they have nothing on you that's the inside of the whole thing that the killing is done in an unpremeditated drunken brawl over cards that it just happened just an untimely end without any strings to it there's no reason why you should lose your nerve your story is straight young merxler came here often he gives a little party here to-night neither you nor your doorkeeper knows a damned one of his guests he vouched for them and that's all you know you heard a row in here then a revolver shot and when you got here the table was upset wine cards and glasses all over the place the boys beating it out through the french doors there and young merxler dead on the floor you just notify the police your loss through being closed for a month makes it a cinch your story straight you don't have to tell the police that your share of the split is the best bet you ever made in your life let me do the worrying i'm the one who's taking the risk i'm the one who's invited him to the party that the police will be told he was giving you can leave it to me that nothing goes wrong i've got my own skin staked on this there won't be any mistake made dead men can't talk the only thing i'm bothered about is what is keeping bull mccann he might billy kane drew suddenly back from the window and crouched down again against the wall of the building someone unless he was curiously mistaken was out there in the lane at the rear of the place he was listening intently now but there was a strange turmoil in his brain that seemed somehow to divide his attention that had made his act of caution one that was almost purely automatic murder that casual discussion of murder there was something within him soul deep that he could not quite analyze save that it seemed a lust for murder was upon him too possessing him engulfing him would that be murder was it murder to crush out the life of a poison fanged snake there was a fury upon him but a most strange fury a fury that was utterly cold and utterly merciless murder yes he knew now beyond question that there was to be murder that the stage for it was set with a devil's craft with the craft of the rat whose identity he had assumed that it would appear on the face of it nothing more than quite a logical outcome of a life led by young merxler that there would appear to be no connection whatever with young merxler's death and what was to follow but what was it that was to follow how in what way was this murder in dollars and cents to show a profit at the next meeting of the unhallowed directorate of crime how did carlin strange how his mind should isolate itself from his immediate surroundings and yet leave him fully conscious of those surroundings he was still listening listening intently there was no mistake a boot scraped against a board someone was climbing the fence came then the soft thud of feet dropping to the ground and now a quick step across the yard billy kane's revolver was in his hand if the newcomer came around the corner of the house dark as it was it was almost certain that no the other had halted evidently before those shuttered french doors and was rapping softly three raps a single rap two raps the raps were repeated someone moved swiftly across the floor of the room there was the faint clash of portier rings and the sound of the french doors being opened billy kane was at the window again a third man was in the room now carlin was speaking sharply you've been a long time coming bull the newcomer his back turned to billy kane shrugged his shoulders i had to wait until merxler went out he answered i didn't lose no time after that and i come downtown as fast as i could i ain't been much more than half an hour from merxler's to here well all right grunted carlin have any trouble nix said the other i slipped the envelope into the drawer of the safe all right it's a cinch the family was all upstairs carlin nodded where are the securities he demanded the man took what billy kane could see were a number of stock and bond certificates from his pocket and handed them to carlin carlin nodded again as he ran through the papers rapidly how much did you leave in the safe he inquired crisply what red told me about the ten or twelve thousand all right said carlin good work bull beat it now the man turned and left the room billy kane heard him step across the yard heard him climb the fence heard carlin within the room close the shuttered french doors but this time billy kane made no movement save that there was a curious twitching of his face muscles as his jaws locked together 
All the bald, hellish brutality of the scheme was beginning to take form now in his mind. It was a plant, all of it, the letter, the will, a plant with the devil's stamp of ingenuity upon it. And it was the man who had just gone from the room, Bull McCann, who had passed him on that black stairway from the basement in Merxler's home. Carlin was laughing in a viciously jubilant way as he came back to the ex croupier's side. Ha <laughs> ha! Fifty thousand dollars! said Carlin as he thrust the securities into the inside pocket of his coat and patted the pocket complacently. Fifty thousand, Jerry, and all of it in Theodore Rogers' name. I keep stalling the kid on the idea of transferring the securities into his own name. Told him there was no hurry, that he could clip the coupons and get the dividend checks, so all right, just the same. I was his attorney, too, see? <laughs> Works pretty smooth, eh, Jerry? Too bad you didn't get a chance to have a look at that letter in the will. Oh, that chipper did the job. And they're the best pieces of forged penwork that was ever pulled in America. Some head the rat's got. I'll give him credit for that. He worded the letter. It's prima facie evidence that the kid was blowing the coin just as fast as he did when he came into his father's money. And nobody's surprised that most of it has gone up in smoke. <laughs> and besides that, it's a confession. Well, what happens? Merxler is killed in a gambling brawl at which nobody is surprised, either. His safe is opened, the will is found, and with it that little hymn of hate against me, which accounts for what would otherwise have been a fool play in having kept the will. I am found to be the executor, empowered to transfer and sell and administer the estate. And we find that all that's left is about uh, ten thousand, which is all I have to account for. I enter that as the value of the estate, split it among the beneficiaries, and— <laughs> He chuckled softly. I generously waive my claim to any share in the legacy on the score that the estate has been hit so hard. <laughs> Neat little play, eh, Jerry? Well, after that, there's nothing to it. My signature is legally good on any document, and little by little, here, there we turn the fifty thousand into the long green and pocket it. <laughs> if it's done quietly, a security or so at a time, no one would ever think of digging around to find out if it was one of those on the schedule filed by the estate. <laughs> Feeling better, Jerry? The ex croupier walked over to the buffet, poured out for himself a stiff four fingers of whiskey, and tossed off the neat spirit in a gulp. He forced an uneasy grin. I don't often drink in business hours, he said nervously, but I'm not used to playing this high. Maybe I'm a little shaky. Are you sure fire on the witnesses to that will? Their signatures would have to be proved. No, the only things that are genuine, said Carlin with a malicious laugh. <laughs> we had two of our boys working around a hotel down in Long Island where Rogers spent a month this spring, and where he is supposed to have written his will. <laughs> And they identify their signatures and the story straight. Rogers asked them to witness his signature to a paper, that's all. <laughs> he didn't tell them what the paper was, and they don't know, see? <laughs> if there's any question crops up, the hotel proves that the two men were its employees at the time Rogers was staying there. He pulled out his watch again. It's ten o'clock, he said brusquely. Merxler ought to be showing up. I... The ex-croupier had suddenly laid a finger to his lips in caution. A knock was sounding on the hall door. "'Here he is now,' said the ex-croupier in a lowered voice. "'I told them to send him here as soon as he came.' "'All right, let him in,' instructed Carlin. "'And tell the boys to drift along as soon as they like. It's the man who cuts the first jack.' The ex-croupier opened the door and was instantly continental in both manner and speech. He bowed profoundly as a young man entered. "'Oh, Monsieur Merx, a great pleasure. I was telling Monsieur Carlin that—' Billy Kane had drawn slightly back from the window. His lips were thinned, compressed. The fiendishness of it all had got him now. Carlin, with his suave, oily Judas smile, preening at his Van Dyke beard, and Merxler, for all that he had played the fool for several years now, still with a frank and boyish face, his broad shoulders squared back as he laughed a pleasant greeting. There was a whiteness in Billy Kane's face, 
a whiteness that was like to the fury no longer cold that was white hot in his soul murder well perhaps but it would not be merxler's murder he whipped his mask from his pocket and adjusted it swiftly over his face his fingers automatically tested the mechanism of his revolver as he again looked in through the window the ex-croupier was bowing himself out of the room closing the door behind him quick and silent now in every movement billy kane crept around the corner of the house and crouched before the shuttered french doors he had a minute perhaps two at the outside in which to act before carlin's confederates entered the room he tapped softly with his revolver on the shutters three raps a single rap two raps he repeated it three raps a single rap two raps from within a step came hurriedly across the floor there was the faint clashing of the curtain rings again as the portieres were drawn aside and through the interstices of the shutters came little gleams of light billy kane shifted his grip upon his revolver to the muzzle end the doors opened a few inches cautiously and then carlin's voice who's there what but billy kane was in action now and the words ended in a wild shout of alarm his left hand shot forward like a flash into the opening wrenching the doors wide apart and lithe as a panther in its spring he launched himself forward and struck with the butt of his revolver struck as he would have struck at a mad dog full on carlin's head there was a crash as the man went limply senseless to the floor and another cry from merxler now and then dazing billy kane for an instant by the sudden and unexpected onslaught merxler had sprung and locked his arms around him in a grip of steel they crashed against the table upsetting it let go billy kane panted frantically the whole door lock it you don't understand there was no answer from merxler save another hoarse shout for help here and there about the room they lurched staggered reeled but billy kane was the stronger it seemed only by inches but still by inches they were nearing the hall door there was something of ghastly irony in this frenzied effort of the boy to bar his own road to safety but there was something fine in it too something that even as he fought found recognition in billy kane's mind the boy spendthrift though he might be a fool with his money though he might be was game to the core in standing by a man whom he believed to be his friend there was an uproar now from the interior of the house there came the rush of feet along the hall another instant and they would be at the door massing his strength for the effort billy kane tore himself free flung merxler back and plunged forward the door was being opened now he hurled his weight against it quick merxler quick the inside pocket of carlin's coat he gasped out quick there was a yell of fury from the hall as the door slammed shut and billy kane turned the key and then a crash upon it and another as human battering rams launched themselves madly against the panels over his shoulder billy kane saw merxler standing hesitant glancing in stupefaction alternately from the door to carlin on the floor a panel cracked and splintered. Billy Kane's revolver roared like a cannon shot through the room. The bullet, aimed low, ripped along the threshold. Merxler, the inside pocket of Carlin's coat, he said in deadly quiet. Man, are you mad? Hurry, they'll have us both in another minute. The revolver shot had checked the rush against the door for an instant, though only for an instant. But that instant was enough. Merxler, stung into action, had leapt to Carlin's side and was bending over the man and then he was on his feet staring wildly at the papers in his hand good god watch this he cried out watch the french doors the fence run for it said billy kane tensely and fired again and the next instant the room was in darkness as he switched off the light and in another with merxler running now beside him he had crossed the few feet of yard and was swinging himself over the fence from behind came the rip and tear and smash of the yielding door shouts yells oaths a confusion of noises but billy kane had reached the cross street now and pulling the mask from his face jerking his hat brim far over his eyes turned in the opposite direction from that in which he had entered the lane and urging merxler on was running at top speed at the next block they swerved again and billy kane with a restraining pressure on merxler's arm here dropped into a slower and less noticeable pace there was little or no chance of pursuit now no one it seemed had taken the immediate initiative of following them into the lane yet billy kane made a wide detour before he finally reached the waiting taxicab get in he said to merxler and crisply to the chauffeur drive as fast as you know how go up the street at the rear of the purple scarf he followed merxler into the cab 
Merxler drew his hand across his eyes in a dazed way and laughed nervously. "'I can't see your face now, and, and you had a mask on before,' he said jerkily. "'This is a queer business. Who are you? What, what's it mean? Those securities were in my safe an hour ago. How did they get into Carlin's pocket? What was he doing with them?' "'Stoop over.' said Billy Kane quietly. He handed Merxler the forged letter and flashed the ray of his lamp upon the paper. His head bent forward, Merxler read the letter, and his face, already white under the ray, gradually took on a drawn, grayish pallor. I, I never wrote this, he faltered. It's my handwriting, but, but I, I never wrote it. Nor your uncle this said Billy Kane, the same grim, quiet intonation in his voice as he placed the will in turn in Merxler's hand. The light played on the paper, and over Merxler's face Billy Kane sat drawn back in the shadows. There was moisture on Merxler's forehead as he looked up after a moment. "'My God!' he whispered hoarsely. "'What does this mean?' The flashlight was out. It was dark in the cab now, and the taxi rattled on traversing block after block. Billy Kane spoke swiftly, sketching the events of the night. Merxler did not move, save that at the end his hand sought and found and closed tight on Billy Kane's arm. It was Merxler, in a new light, who spoke. "'You have uh, saved my life, and you haven't preached,' he said slowly. "'I am a fool. I played the fool. I never would have tried to get away with it if I hadn't played the fool all my life. I guess perhaps I had my lesson tonight.' But, but fool or not, his voice rasped suddenly, bitter hard. Carlin will pay for this, or— You will. Yet. Billy Kane cut in grimly. You know too much, and you haven't a minute to lose. They lost their heads for a moment in the confusion and the darkness when we got away. But their one hope now will be to get you before you tell your story. They may figure that you will hesitate about telling it, as you would have to admit your presence at Jerry's gambling hell— and they may figure that you wouldn't act anyway before morning. Do you understand? That's their chance. Your chance is the police without a second's delay. And you may even get Carlin before he regains consciousness, or before they try to move him if you're quick enough. I know your story will sound strange, with an unknown man and a mask running through it, but you have only to tell the truth. You have all the evidence you need. The police will know the chipper who forged the papers, and the police will know how to make those fake witnesses to the will squeal. It's a different proposition now with them than simply appearing before Carlin and a notary public and swearing to the signatures. Understand? Yes, said Merxler tersely. You're right, and I'll see it through. But you, you saved my life, and— I get out here, said Billy Kane, and leaning forward suddenly, tapped sharply on the glass front. They had turned into the street that was not only in the rear of the purple scarf, but was equally in the rear of that secret entrance into the rat's lair. He held out his hand to Merxler. "'Good night, Merxler. I—' "'But—' Merxler cried as the taxi stopped. "'I can't let you go like this. I owe you too much. Who are you? What is your name? Where can I find you to—' "'I'm trying to find myself,' said Billy Kane with grim whimsicality. "'Let it go at that.' He caught Merxler's hand in a hard grip. "'Good night, Merxler, and good luck,' he said, and stepping quickly from the taxi, closed the door. He handed the chauffeur another bill. "'Drive this gentleman to police headquarters. Fast,' he ordered, and turning, moved swiftly away down the street, hugging the shadows again, avoiding the rays of the street lamps. He slipped into the lane, gained the shed, and from the shed made his way through the underground passage to the secret door. Listened here intently for a moment, then stepped through into the rat's room, and groped forward toward the electric light that hung over the table. It was strange. There was something almost mockingly ironic in it all. It was like the night before, again. In peril himself as grave as Merxler's, he had saved Merxler, and his own peril remained, was increased even. For the inner circle of this crime world that ranked him as a trusted confederate would be aroused now to an unbridled pitch of fury and excitement, seeking the unknown man in the mask who had foiled them tonight. Suspicious as they would be of every one, he had now that suspicion to combat, and he could ill afford that a breath of it should touch him. 
His all was at stake. Red Vallon, with the underworld at his heels, was enlisted now in a hunt for those rubies, which, if successful, must inevitably discover, too, the identity of the man or men who had murdered David Ellsworth and who had driven him, Billy Kane, into this damnable exile. It was paramount, vital, that he should preserve his authority to keep the underworld at that work, the power to command, the... Billy Kane switched on the electric light and stood staring at the table, grim-faced, his jaws locked tight together, his hand like a flash seeking his revolver in his pocket. His eyes lifted and swept around the room. The swift, quick glance went unrewarded. The room was apparently as he had left it. He crossed quickly to the street door. It was still locked. Again his eyes searched the room. He remembered that she had spoken of other secrets that the room possessed. What were they? Still another entrance? There was no sign of it. He knew only that someone had been here in his absence, and was now flaunting that visit in his face. Was it mockery? A warning? What? It could not have been Red Vallon or any of his pack. It was almost certain that Red Vallon had no knowledge of any secret entrance, and beside, it was too soon for Red Vallon. Was it the woman? He shook his head. It was hardly likely, and his reason told him no. She had been outspoken enough that evening, and she had given no hint of this. Who then? And what was its meaning? Was it grim mockery? A grimmer warning? What? On the table, ostentatiously placed in full view, and identified beyond possibility of a mistake, by a piece cut from the corner of the original plush tray on which it and many of its fellows had rested, was one of the rubies stolen from David Ellsworth's vault. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve A Clue. Billy Kane's eyes lifted from his plate and fixed in a curiously introspective way on Whitey Jack's unhandsome and unshaven face across the little table. Twenty four hours. He was out in the open now, convalescent. Twenty-four hours, and as far as Red Vallon and Bertie Rose were concerned specifically, and the underworld generally, there had been not a shred of success. He had unleashed the underworld, but the underworld had picked up neither thread nor clue. The underground clearing houses for stolen goods, the fences, had yielded up no single one of the rubies belonging to the Ellsworth collection. The lead that he had given Bertie Rose in respect to Jackson, the dead footman, had, up to the present at least, proved abortive. Well, perhaps he, Billy Kane, would be more successful. The twenty-four hours had not been wholly fruitless. Perhaps before the night was out there would be a different story to tell, perhaps a grim and ugly story. There was one clue which had developed but a clue that was to be entrusted to neither Red Vallon nor Bertie Rose, nor any of the pack. Even they, case-hardened, steeped in crime though they were, might balk at pushing that clue to its ultimate conclusion. They might weaken at the limit. He, Billy Kane, would not weaken because, as between his own life and the life of one who he was already satisfied was a murderer, he would not fling his own life away. His life was at stake. Red Vallon's wasn't. Bertie Rose's wasn't. It made a difference in the limit. An attendant in a dirty, beer-stained apron sidled to the edge of the table. The man had been eager in his attentions, deferential, almost obsequious. "'What are you for now, Bundy?' he inquired solicitously. Billy Kane smiled as he shook his head and jerked his hand by way of invitation toward Whitey Jack. He, Billy Kane, was the rat, alias Bundy Morgan. He had never in his life before been in this none-too-reputable place run by one two-finger tasker that combined at one and the same time a restaurant and dance hall of the lowest type, yet he found himself not only well-known but an honored guest. He had known of the place by name and reputation. It was the sort of place that seemed naturally one the rat would frequent. 
and he had told Red Vallon that he would eat here this evening. Red Vallon would have to make a report somewhere, and he, Billy Kane, had become none too sure of his own temporary quarters. That secret door, that underground passage into the rat's lair, had not proved an altogether unmixed blessing. There was the woman in black, who had been an uninvited, unwelcome, and almost sinister visitor on two occasions already, and there was, far more disturbing still, the matter of that ruby from the Ellsworth collection, which had found its way mysteriously to the table in that room, the single stone from the collection that had come to light since the murder two nights ago. Whitey Jack accepted the unspoken invitation. "'Give me another mug of suds,' he said. The glass was replenished. "'You seem to have pulled a good job, Whitey,' said Billy Kane approvingly. "'The tenement is next to the café on the corner, hmm? "'All right, I know the place. What next?' Whitey Jack gulped down half the contents of his glass. "'I guess I did,' he said complacently. "'I wasn't piping the light all day for nothing, what? "'The place has three floors and two flats on each floor, savvy?' It ain't much of a place, neither. Peter's flat is on the second floor, on the right as you go up. There's nobody at home, but he comes down there himself to give the place the once over one night a week. The family's away somewhere for a vacation, sniffing in the ocean breezes at some boarding house. Gee, say, the guy must have money to pull the high brow out of town in the summer stuff for the family. Billy Kane nodded. Whitey Jack finished his glass and drew his sleeve across his mouth. Well, two of the flats is vacant, he said. One on the second floor and one on the top. The other one on the top over Peter's flat is where that crazy old fiddler guy, Savnak, hangs out all by his lonesome. But Savnak won't bother his none. He's out every night. He goes down to Dutchy Vetter's jewelry shop, and him and Dutchy being nuts on music and pinochle, they goes to it for half the night. Old savnak has got bats in his belfry, I guess, but I guess he can fiddle all right. I heard he used to be a big bug leading some foreign orchestra, and was a count or duke or something, and then the dope got him, and then he came out here. He ain't living like a duke now, and I guess it takes him all his time to scratch up the rent. Bats, that's what he's got. Bats and dope. They got him to play one night down at Heaney's Music Hall, and, and he went up in the air and quit flat because the waiters kept circulating around and dishing out the suds while he was playing. Say, what do you know about that? And then... Stick to cases, Whitey interrupted Billy Kane patiently. I'm expecting company in a few minutes. What about the ground floor? Who lives there? Oh, oh, dear, said Whitey Jack somewhat contemptuously. I don't know what your lay is, but there's nothing there to bother yes neither. There's a couple of sisters about sixty years old apiece on one side, and a young guy that just got married on the other. Back entrance, inquired Billy Kane casually. Whitey Jack shook his head. Nope, he said. Nothing doing. There's a backyard about uh, four inches square, but the building behind butts right up against it, and there ain't no lane. But you can get in the front door tonight, whether it's locked or not, for there ain't any street lamp near enough to do you any harm. Good work, said Billy Kane. He pushed his plate away from in front of him. I guess you'd better beat it now, Whitey. Whitey Jack, of the lesser breed of criminal, self-attached familiar to the man he believed to be the rat and an aristocrat of crime land, rose from his seat with evident reluctance. There was a sort of dog-like faithfulness and admiration in his eyes, the same deference in his manner that seemed to mark the dealings of everyone in the underworld with the rat. But the look on Whitey Jack's face was nevertheless one of undisguised disappointment. "'Ain't I in on this any more?' he pleaded. "'Ain't I got nothing more to do with it?' "'Yes,' said Billy Kane. He lowered his voice. "'You've got more to do, and what will count for a lot more than you've already done. Keep your mouth shut tight.' 
He leaned across the table, and his hand closed in a friendly pressure on the other's arm. Take the night off. Show up in the morning. Beat it now, Whitey. Whitey Jack left the place. The waiter removed the dishes from the table. Billy Kane leaned back in his chair, and his eyes, the introspective stare back in their depths, traveled slowly over his surroundings. The tables, ranged around the sides of the room, were but sparsely occupied. The polished section of the floor in the center was deserted. It was too early for the votaries of the bunny hug in the turkey trot to start in with their nightly gyrations. Two-finger Tasker's was in a state of lethargy, as it were. A few hours later it would awake to a riot of hilarity and come into its own with a surging crowd and packed tables, but it was too early for that yet. Billy Kane's fingers slipped mechanically into his vest pocket, and hidden there, mechanically began to twirl a small, hard object, irregular in its shape, between their tips. His face hardened suddenly. The touch of that little object stirred up in an instant a grim flood of speculation. It was the ruby from the Ellsworth collection that he had found on his return to the rat's den last night. It worried him. How had it got there? Who had put it there? And why? Above all, why? Only a few hours before, turning his purloined authority to account, he had set the underworld the task of tracing the Ellsworth collection. And mysteriously there had appeared upon his table this single stone, ostentatiously identified by a piece cut from one of the original plush trays in which the stones had been kept. The bare possibility that it had been Red Vallon or some of his breed who had stumbled upon the stone in their search through the underground exchanges, and had left it there as evidence of a partial success for him to find on his return, had occurred to him. But a cautious probing of Red Vallon that morning had put a final and emphatic negative on that theory. Who then, and why? It had seemed like a ghastly jeer when he had seen that stone there on the table, and the prelude to some sinister act that he could not foresee, and against which, therefore, he could not prepare any defense. Did someone know that he was not the rat, that, desperate with no other thing to do, he had snatched at the rule fate had thrust out to him, and was playing it now? Who, then? Not the woman in black. Her acceptance of him as the rat had been altogether too genuine. Not the underworld. Even a suspicion there would have been followed by a knife thrust long before this. Not the actual perpetrators of David Ellsworth's murder, if they knew him to be Billy Kane, for their one aim had been to fasten the crime irrevocably upon him. All their hellish ingenuity had been centered on that one object, and they would certainly, therefore, have lost no time in giving the police, in some roundabout guarded way, a tip as to his identity. His brain whirled with the problem, and ached in an actual physical sense. It had been aching all day. He could minimize his peril if he cared to make the wish father to the thought. He could not exaggerate it. It seemed impossible that his identity was known, but even so, the question as to where that stone had come from and why— still remained unanswered. Was it then another possibility? The murderers of David Ellsworth, who, while still believing him to be the Rat, and having discovered in some way that as the Rat he was working against them, had given him this ugly and significant warning to keep his hands off? Well, if that were so, he was still in no less danger, for he must go on. To turn aside was to fail, and to fail, quite equally, meant death. The hard pressure of his lips curved the corners of his mouth downward in sharp lines. Nor was the question of that stone all. Since last night, when the cloak of respectability had been stripped from Carlin, and the man in the mask had turned the tables on the crime coterie in the gambling hell run by Jerry, the ex croupier of Monte Carlo, the underworld had been in a nasty mood, ugly, suspicious, in a ferment of unrest. It was another alias added to his role, another alias to safeguard even more zealously, if possible, than his unsought role of the rat. He was the man in the mask. He shrugged his shoulders suddenly. Quite so. The mask was even at that moment in his inside coat pocket. If it were found there, he laughed harshly. It seemed as though he were being sucked in nearer and nearer to the center of some seething vortex that hungrily sought to engulf him. 
It seemed as though his brain ground and mulled around in a sort of ghastly cycle. When he tried to bring one thing into individual outline, some other thing impinged, and all became a jumbled medley, like pieces of a puzzle, no one of which would fit into another. The underworld looked askance and whispered through the corners of its mouth as it asked the question, who was the man in the mask? And he, Billy Kane, who could answer that question, sitting here in two-fingered taskers in the heart of that underworld, was asking himself another, a dozen others, whose answers were vital, life and death to him in the most literal sense. Who was the woman in black, who, like a nemesis, hovered over the rat? Where was the man whose personality had been so strangely thrust upon him, Billy Kane? When would the rat return? Had he, Billy Kane, even the few hours at his disposal this evening that were necessary to enable him to run down the clue which he had discovered, and upon which he was banking his all now to clear himself, to bring to justice the murderers who had so craftily saddled their guilt upon him, had he even that much time before the inevitable crash came? This evening, yes, this evening. His fingers came from his vest pocket and his hand clenched fiercely at his side. He would go the limit. His mind was made up to that. He had never thought that he would consider, calculate, and weigh the pros and cons of taking another's life, much less come to a deliberate decision to do so. But he had made that decision now, and if it were necessary, he would carry it through. It seemed to affect him with an unnatural cold indifference that surprised himself, that decision. It seemed to be only the result, the outcome, that continued to concern him. If he had luck with him tonight, he would win through. Red Vallon, Birdie Rose, and the underworld had so far failed. He had kept prodding them on, and would continue to prod them on, even now, on the basis that he could not afford to let go of a single chance. But his hopes, that amounted now to a practical certainty of success, were almost wholly centered on his own efforts in the next few hours. He stirred impulsively in his chair. The murderers of David Ellsworth had been too cunning, it seemed, had overstepped themselves at last in their anxiety to weave their net of evidence still more irrevocably around him. The affair of last night, the capture of Carlin by the police, and the social prominence of both Carlin and Merxler had furnished the morning papers with material for glaring headlines and columns of sensational story. But even so, all this had not by any means overshadowed the Ellsworth murder and robbery. The press was still alive with it. New York was still agog with the old millionaire philanthropist's assassination, and with what it believed to be the traitorous and abandoned act of not only a trusted and confidential secretary, but of one who at the same time was the son of a lifelong friend. The blood surged burning hot into Billy Kane's face. From coast to coast they had heralded him as the vilest of his kind. He was a pariah, an outcast, a thing of loathing. Yes, the papers were still giving him and the Ellsworth murder prominence enough. But that prominence was not without its compensation, since it had furnished him with the clue now in his possession. The inquest had been held late yesterday afternoon, too late for more than brief mention in the evening papers. But this morning the papers had carried a full and practically verbatim report of the proceedings. He had read the report, not daring at first to believe what he wanted to believe, afraid that his eyes were playing a mocking trick upon him, and then he had read it again in a sort of grim, unholy joy. Jackson, the footman, who he knew was one of the murderers, was dead, and so far Bertie Rose had been unable to trace the man's family or connections. But Peters, the butler, was not dead, and out of Peters' own mouth, in his effort apparently to seal for all time his Billy Kane's guilt, Peters had convicted himself. True, before a jury, Peters had done himself no harm. That was the hellish ingenuity of the scheme that fitted in with all the rest of the devil's craft with which the affair had been planned. Peters, in the public's eyes, or before any court, was treading on safe and solid ground, for his Billy Kane's simple denial was worth nothing in any man's opinion today. But he, Billy Kane, knew that Peters' testimony was not fact. Peters had testified 
that he had seen him, Billy Kane, leave the house about seven o'clock, which was true. Peters had then deliberately testified that half an hour later, though he had not seen Mr. Kane return, he had seen Mr. Kane come quietly down the back stairs and enter the library, which, besides being untrue, since he, Billy Kane, was not even in the house at that time, was also equivalent to swearing away his Billy Kane's life. Peters, continuing his evidence, had stated that he was quite sure he had not been seen by Mr. Kane, as he, Peters, at that moment was standing just inside the cloakroom off the hall. He did not see Mr. Kane emerge again from the library, but some fifteen minutes later a telephone call came in for Mr. Ellsworth, and knowing Mr. Ellsworth to be in the library, he connected with that room. He tried several times, but could get no reply. Finally he went to the library door and opened it, and found Mr. Ellsworth with his skull crushed in dead upon the floor, the private vault and safe open and looted. He at once called the police. He stated that it was obvious Mr. Kane had made his escape from the library through the stenographer's room at the rear, and from there to the back entrance, where, later on again, as the police already knew, returning once more in the hope, presumably, of recovering the card with the combinations of the safe and vault on it in his handwriting, he had been discovered by Jackson the footman, and had killed Jackson, who had tried to capture him. Billy Kane's hands were shoved in an apparently nonchalant manner into the side pockets of his coat, to hide them from view now. The nails were biting into the palms of his hand. Killed. That was the word Peters had used. Killed. It was very subtle of Peters to have used that word. It just clinched the whole story with the seemingly obvious. Everybody believed that he, Billy Kane, had killed Jackson as well as David Ellsworth. Yes, Peters had put the finishing touch on the evidence that was meant to free the actual perpetrators, himself quite evidently amongst them, from punishment and to send him, Billy Kane, if caught, as their proxy to the death chair in Sing Sing. Quite so and Peters thought himself quite safe. What had Peters to fear from a hunted wretch, who he undoubtedly believed was miles away, fleeing for his life, cowering from the sight of his fellow humans, afraid to show his face? But Peters and his accomplices had overshot the mark. The evidence was final, incontrovertible, damning, only it was not true. He, Billy Kane, would not dispute it with a jury. He would put Peters on a witness stand of a grimmer nature than that. He had known on the night of the crime that Jackson, the footman, was one of the guilty men, but he had not suspected that the dignified, perfectly trained Peters, the butler, with his fastidiously trimmed grey mutton-chop side-whiskers, was likewise one of the band. And now he wondered why he had not thought of it. He saw Peters in quite a different light now. A hundred little incidents metamorphosed the man's excessive efficiency and attentiveness into a smug mask of hypocrisy, and corroborative from this new viewpoint, where, for instance, had Peters, as it now appeared, got the money to send his family away even to a boarding-house? Butlers were not in the habit of sending their families away to the seaside for the summer. Even Whitey Jack had not failed to comment on that fact. Well, he was satisfied that he knew the real Peters now and it was not too late. It was Peter's or himself now. It was his life, or Peter's life, unless Peter's laid bare to the last shred the whole plot, and the name of every man connected with it. And the stage was set. From the moment he had read the papers that morning, he had put Whitey Jack at work, and Whitey Jack had done well, exceedingly well. He, Billy Kane, knew that Peter's was married and had a family, but he had not known Peter's home address. Whitey Jack had proved a most praiseworthy ferret. He, Billy Kane, knew that Thursday was always Peter's night off. This was Thursday night. Peter's then, if he followed his usual custom, would visit his flat tonight, and since the man's family was away, Peter's and he would be alone. It was fortunate that the family was away. Luck seemed to be turning. It precluded the necessity of getting Peter's somewhere else, alone. It simplified matters. Peter's flat would serve most excellently for that interview. He laughed a little now. He was strangely cool, strangely composed. He was in a mood in which he found difficulty in recognizing himself. 
He was going tonight to wring from a man either that man's life or that man's confession. He was absolutely merciless in that resolve. He would not turn back. Nothing would make him swerve one iota from that determination. He would go the limit. And yet he sat there, entirely unmoved, callous. Well, after all, why not? If the man was already a murderer, his life was already forfeit. If he, Billy Kane, must choose between losing his own life and permitting one of the murderers of David Ellsworth to profit further thereby, would one hesitate long over that choice, or hesitate to go the limit? End of chapter 12「Thirteen of Doors of the Night」by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen The Cipher Message Billy Kane's hands came from his pockets again, and he leisurely lighted a cigarette. Though sitting sideways to the door, he nevertheless unostentatiously commanded a full view of the entrance. Red Vallon had just entered and after a moment's pause in which the man's eyes searched around the dance hall, was coming forward, threading his way through the intervening tables. Billy Kane flung a short nod of recognition in the direction of the approaching gangster, and then his eyes fastened in a sort of hard, curious expectancy on the street door again. Whether or not it was intuition or premonition, induced by what had happened the previous night when Red Vallon had been followed, he did not know. But he was somehow prepared now, a little more than prepared, almost sure, in fact, that there would be a repetition of last night's occurrence. Red Vallon dropped into the seat vacated by Whitey Jack. "'Hello, Bundy!' he greeted affably. "'Hello, Red.' The response was purely mechanical. Billy Kane shifted his cigarette from one corner of his mouth to the other to hide a smile in which there was no humor. His intuition, if it were intuition, had not been at fault. A woman had just entered the dance hall. He was not likely to mistake that slim, graceful figure, nor those dark, steady eyes that were spanning the room and resting upon him. He could not see the lurking mockery in those eyes. The distance was a little too great for that, but his imagination could depict it readily enough, nor did it require much imagination." It was the woman in black. He glanced at Red Vallon. Red Vallon's back was turned to the door, and he had quite evidently not observed her. The beer-stained attendant hurried to the table. "'What'll you have, Red?' inquired Billy Kane pleasantly. Red Vallon waved the man away. "Nix," he said in a lowered voice. "'I got to beat it. I got to meet Bertie Rose. There's something doing.' Billy Kane, even as he watched that trim figure make its way to a table near the wall on a line with his own, leaned abruptly, eagerly forward toward Red Vallon. He felt his pulse throb and quicken. Luck seemed to be breaking wide open at last. If, coupled with his own clue, Red Vallon and Bertie Rose had unearthed another, this infernal masquerade that threatened his life at every turn was as good as ended. "'What is it?' he demanded sharply. "'Have you spotted the stones?' Red Vallon shook his head. Uh, "'Not them stones,' he said a little uneasily. Uh, "'Some others. I got orders.' Billy Kane's face hardened. "'Orders?' he echoed shortly. "'Didn't I tell you last night that everything else was piker stuff? A half million in rubies, that's what we're after. To the limit, understand? To the limit. Orders. Who gave you any orders except to stick to the game?' "'You know,' said Red Vallon, and pushed a sheet of paper across the table. "'Tear it up when you're through. That's no good to me any more. I just wanted to show it to you so you'd know I wasn't sidestepping on my own.' Billy Kane did not tear it up. His face, still set hard, showed no other signs of emotion as his eyes studied the paper, but inwardly they came a sort of numbed dismay. It was a code message. It meant nothing to him in one sense. In another it meant a very great deal. He was supposed to know what this jumble of letters signified. Red Vallon expected him to know. To arouse Red Vallon's suspicion for an instant was simply and literally equivalent to bringing down the underworld upon him, and the underworld would be as gentle and merciful as a pack of starving wolves. 
The jumble of letters seemed to possess a diabolical leer all their own as he stared at them. Was it a code that, with the key in one's possession, one could read at a glance? He did not know. Was it a code that required elaborate and painstaking effort to decipher? He did not know. Did Red Vallon, sitting there across the table watching him, expect him to give instant indication that the code message was plain and intelligible to him? He did not know. There was only one course to take, the middle course. He laid the paper on the table, and laid his clenched fist over the paper, as he leaned further over truculently toward Red Vallon. "'I tell you again that everything else is piker stuff,' he said angrily. "'Do you get me?' What have you done, you and Birdie and the rest? Have you got anywhere today? Do you know where that secretary guy Billy Kane is? Do you know where those rubies are? No, said Red Vallon hurriedly. We haven't turned up anything yet, but... But you're going to. By nosing around after something else, snapped Billy Kane. Do you think I'm going to see the biggest thing that was ever pulled slip through my fingers? If you do, you've got another thing coming. Things have changed since I've been away, huh? How long since there's been any monkeying with what I dope out? Don't get sore, Bundy, said Red Vallon appeasingly. It's nothing like that. You know how it was. Carlin's arrest last night queered everything. That cursed snitch with the mask on put everything on the rough. There wasn't any meeting. You know who sent that code there. Well, he didn't know about the other job or, or that he was butting in on you. Tumble? <laughs> There ain't nothing to be sore about, Bundy. Say, me and Bertie ain't going to be more than an hour or two doing this trick anyhow. Someone of the Mole's gang must have leaked. Or maybe one of the boys piped him off. I don't know. But we got him cold this trip. He's a slick one, all right. And he's been getting away with the goods quite a lot lately and giving us the laugh. Oh, you know all about that. Well, this is where he doesn't laugh, see? He's pulling a nice one tonight. Got it all fixed up to make it look like somebody else did it. Sure. Well, we're not kicking at that, so long as we get the loot. Sure. We'll let him pull it. All right. All right. Believe me. Billy Kane appeared to be unmoved. He studied the gangster coldly. And how does it happen that you and Birdie, out of all the rest, are picked for this? Red Vallon indulged in an ugly grin. Cause we know the mole down to the ground, he said but principally because the Mole knows us. There won't be any fooling when we spring a showdown. He's wise to that, and he'll come across. And besides, ten only Bertie and me, I'm taking some of my own gang along as well. Billy Kane scowled. It probably mattered very little indeed that Red Vallon's efforts were to be sidetracked for the next few hours, and should he, Billy Kane, during that time be successful, it mattered not at all. But his play for the moment was to preserve his role in Red Vallon's eyes, to keep away from anything intimate concerning the purport of this cipher message that still lay beneath his clenched hand, and that might so easily betray his ignorance, and above all now to get rid of Red Vallon before any such awkward and dangerous impasse could arise. He shrugged his shoulders, but his voice was still sullen as he spoke. "'Well, go to it,' he growled. "'Go and pick up your chicken feed. "'But you get this into your nut red and let it soak there. "'After this,' he leaned far over the table, "'his face thrust almost into Red Vallon's. "'You stay with the game every minute, or quit. "'It's the limit, or quit. "'There's just one thing that counts, "'those rubies or the man who pinched them. "'If we get the man, he'll cough red. <laughs> "'The stones or blood.' Do you think I'm going to let anything queer me on a share of half a million? You don't seem to get what I mean when I say the limit. Look out, I don't give you an object lesson. Red Vallon licked his lips and drew back a little. There was something in Red Vallon's eyes that was not often there. Fear. Ah, it's all right, Bundy, he said with nervous eagerness. I'm with you, sure I am. This thing must have broke loose quick, and that was no idea of crabbing anything else you'd started. I got ten of the best of them combing out the fences for you right now. All right, responded Billy Kane gruffly. Make a report to me on that before morning. Where'll you be? Red Vallon was apparently relieved, for his voice had recovered its buoyancy. At my place, sometime, said Billy Kane curtly. You can wait for me there. 
He smiled suddenly with grim facetiousness. My shoulder's a lot better, even so that maybe I can sit in for a hand myself tonight. I hope you do, said Red Vallon fervently. You always had the knockout punch, Bundy, and it seems like old times. He half rose from his chair, then, looking furtively about him, bent forward over the table. There's something else, Bundy, before I go. That snitch last night at Jerry's, the man in the mask. He's played hell with the crowd. There's no telling what'll tumble down behind Carlin. And it don't look like he's just stumbled on that deal by accident. It don't look good, Bundy. We gotta get him, and get him quick, before he pulls anything more. The word's out to bump him off. Billy Kane nodded. Well, don't lose your nerve over it, Red, he said coolly. If it was by accident, he won't do us any more damage, and we've only got to settle with him for what he's done, providing we can ever find him. If it wasn't accident, he'll show his hand again, won't he? Yes, said Red Vallon. Billy Kane's smile was unpleasant. Well, you will know what to do with him then, won't you? He inquired softly. The gangster's red-rimmed eyes narrowed to slits. Yes, I'll know said Red Vallon coarsely. He made an ugly motion toward his throat. Well, so long, Bundy. Billy Kane nodded again by way of answer. He watched Red Vallon thread his way back among the tables and pass out through the front door. With the gangster out of the way, he picked up the sheet of paper upon which the code message was written, studied it for a moment, then thrust it into his pocket, and his glance traveled to the table opposite to him against the wall, where that slim little figure in black was seated. She appeared to be quite indifferent to his presence, and quite intent upon the consumption of a glass of milk and the sandwich on the plate before her. Billy Kane smiled with grim comprehension. The frugality of the meal was not without its object. It was fairly obvious that she could dispose of what was before her in short order, and leave the place at an instant's notice without inviting undesirable attention to an unfinished meal, if she so desired. It was his move. She had followed Red Vallon in, but she had not followed Red Vallon out. She was waiting for him, Billy Kane. The seat she had chosen had been in plain view of Red Vallon. Therefore, she was evidently free from any fear of recognition on the part of the gangster, and as a logical corollary from probably anybody else in the room. That she gave no sign now, therefore, could mean but one thing. It was his move. If he cared to cross swords with her here, he was at liberty to do so. If he had reasons of his own for preferring a less public meeting, he had only to leave the place, and she would undoubtedly follow. In one sense, she was most solicitous of his welfare. She would do nothing to hamper or hinder him in protecting himself as long as he continued to double-cross and render abortive the crimes of the inner circle of the underworld in which she believed him to be a leader. Failing that, as she had already made it quite clear, she proposed, as near as he could solve the riddle, to expose some past crime of the rats to the police, and end his career via the death chair in Sing Sing. Also, she had made her personal feelings toward him equally clear. She held for him a hatred that was as deep-seated as it was merciless and deadly. He shrugged his shoulders. He, by proxy, stood in the shoes of one who seemingly had done her some irreparable wrong, and since she would dog him all night until she had had the interview that she evidently proposed to have, it might as well be here as anywhere. It mattered very little to him, as the rat, that he should be observed by those in the room to get up from his table and walk over to hers. He was not being watched in the sense that anyone held surveillance over him, and in any case the conventions here in the heart of the underworld were of too elastic a character to have it cause even comment. And besides, in a few hours from now, if luck were with him, he would be through with all this, done with the miserable role of super-crook, which, though it brought a new and greater peril at every move he made, was the one thing that for the present he was dependent upon for his life. He rose crossed the room nonchalantly, and dropped as nonchalantly into the chair at the end of her table, his back to the door. She greeted him with a smile, but it was a smile of the lips only. The dark eyes under the long lashes 
studied him in a cold, uncompromising stare, and there was mockery in their depths, but deeper than the mockery there was contempt and disdain. A cigarette, pulled lazily from his pocket and lighted, preserved his appearance of unconcern. In spite of himself, in spite of the fact that that contemptuous stare was his only through a damnable and abhorrent proxy, he felt suddenly ill at ease. He had never seen her as closely as this before. He had only seen her twice before, once in the dark, and once with the width of the rat's den separating them. He had been conscious then that she was attractive, beautiful, with her clustering masses of brown hair, and the dainty poise of her head and the pure whiteness of her full throat, but he was conscious now that beyond the mere beauty of features lay steadfastness and strength, that in the sweetness of the face there was, too, a wistfulness, do what you would to hide it, and that there was strain there and weariness. And he was suddenly conscious, too, that he disliked the role of the rat more than he had ever disliked it, and that the loathing in those eyes, which never left his face, was responsible for this added distaste of the fact that nature had through some cursed and perverted sense of humor, or malevolence, seen fit to make him the counterpart of a wanton rogue, and worse still, seen fit to force upon him the enactment of that role. He could not tell her that he was not the rat, could he? That he was Billy Kane? Would the loathing in those eyes have grown the less at that? Billy Kane, the thief, the Judas assassin, whose name was a byword throughout the length and breadth of the land at that moment, whose name was a synonym for everything that was vile and hideous and depraved. He was the rat. Until tonight was over. After that, well... After that, who knew? Now he was the rat, and he must play the rat's part. She broke the silence, her voice cool and even. I left it entirely to you as to whether you would come over to this table here or not. I quite understood. Billy Kane forced a sarcastic smile. You are almost too considerate. Am I? she said. Her eyes flashed suddenly. Well, perhaps you are right. I have thought sometimes that even the chance I give you is more than you deserve. I feel so strongly about it, in fact, that the only thing which prevents me from putting an end to it, and you, is that by using you to defeat the ends of your own criminal associates, a great deal of good is being done. They will trap you some time, of course, and knowing them, you know what will happen, and I am satisfied, then, that as an alternative you would prefer Sing Sing in the chair. But you are clever. That is why you grasp at the chance I give you. Oh, you are extremely clever. And you believe you can continue to outwit them indefinitely. I don't think you can, though I admit your cleverness, cunning, and craft. You flatter me, said Billy Kane ironically. No, she said, her voice suddenly lowered, passionate, tense. I hate you. You told me that last night. You told me that last night. Billy Kane indolently blew a ring of cigarette smoke, sealing words. I am beginning to believe you. Did you follow Red Vallon in here to tell me the same thing again? She did not answer for a moment. Sometimes you make me lose my faith in God, she said in a slow, restrained way. It is hard to believe that a God, a just God, could have created such men as you. Billy Kane removed his cigarette from his lips and flicked the ash away with a tap of his forefinger. He felt the color mount and tinge his cheeks. There was something, not alone in her words, but in her tone, that struck at him and hurt. The brown eyes, deep, full of implacable condemnation, burned into his. What was it that the rat had done to her, or hers? He turned slightly away. An anger, smoldering in his soul, burst into flames. He was the rat by proxy, and the proxy was damnable. He could not tell her he was not the rat. He could not tell her he was Billy Kane. He must play on with his detestable role. He must play the rat. What answer would the rat have made to her? Cut that out, rasped Billy Kane. Yes, she said quietly. I spoke impulsively. 
There are only two things in life that affect you your own safety, and to be quite sure that you get all of your share out of your crimes, and, if possible, somebody else's share as well. But the latter consideration is at an end now, isn't it, Bundy? I think I have taken care of that. It's just a question of whether you can save yourself or not with those clever wits of yours. Well, she shrugged her shoulders suddenly, you did very well last night. His life would not be worth very much if the underworld should ever lay hands on the man in the mask. "'Would it, Bundy?' He did not answer her. "'Yes, you did very well indeed,' she went on calmly. "'You will meet somewhere else, of course, as soon as you can find a suitable place, but you will hold no more of your secret council meetings at Jerry's for some time to come.' Billy Kane's face was impassive now. He was apparently intent only on the thin blue spiral of smoke that curled upward from the tip of his cigarette. So those meetings of that cursed directorate of crime had been held at Jerry's, had they? He had not known that. Well, suppose, suggested Billy Kane curtly, that we come to the point. What is it that you want tonight? I am coming to the point, she answered levelly. Owing to the events of last night, your organization is in confusion. Some of the more faint-hearted of your partners have temporarily even taken to their heels. But even so, the organization's activities can hardly come to an abrupt standstill. You will perhaps remember a somewhat similar occasion once before. There are perhaps certain matters that are imperative, that cannot wait. Is that not so, Bundy? And in such an emergency it is left to, uh, shall we call him, the organization's secretary, to keep things going. Personal touch is lost with one another, but there is still a way... I know it does not matter now that Red Vallon received a written order a little while ago. I followed Red Vallon here. I think he gave that order to you. Billy Kane looked at her for a moment, a quizzical, whimsical expression creeping into his face. She was in deadly earnest, he knew that well. And yet there was a certain sense of humor here, too. A grim humor with something of the sardonic in it, and nothing of mirth. Red Vallon's code order was quite as meaningless to him as it would be to her. Sure, said Billy Kane, alias the rat, and chuckled. <laughs> sure, he gave it to me. You don't think I'd hold anything out on you, do you? Sure, he gave it to me. He tossed the paper across the table toward her. Help yourself. All you gotta do is ask for anything I got, and it's yours. You're as welcome as the sunshine to it. She studied it for an instant, calmly. Billy Kane, watching her narrowly, frowned slightly in a puzzled way. She appeared to be neither agitated nor confused. She raised her eyes to his, a glint half of mockery, half of menace, in their brown depths. "'Did you think I did not know it was in cipher?' she inquired coldly. "'You would hardly have been so obliging otherwise, would you? It is always in cipher under these circumstances, isn't it? Well, what is the translation?' "'Red Vallon didn't tell me,' said Billy Kane complacently. Oh, "'Quite probably not,' she countered sharply. "'It was hardly necessary, was it? "'But since you have decoded it yourself?' Billy Kane shrugged his shoulders. "'I've been away so long,' he said, "'that I've forgotten the key.' "'Really?' She was smiling at him in derision now. "'In other words, you refuse to tell me what it is.' "'Don't you think you expect a little too much from me?' He forced a sudden roughness into his tones. I haven't decoded it yet, as a matter of fact. But if I had, do you think I'm looking for trouble to give you the chance to force me into another mess? She shook her head in a sort of mocking tolerance. Does it really matter, Bundy? She said softly. You are not as bright this evening as usual. I know that some crime is planned and set forth here on this paper. It really makes no vital difference to me to know beforehand specifically just what that crime is. For if it succeeds, I shall know about it, and in that case I shall equally know that you did not prevent it. I think you quite understand what that means, don't you, Bundy? However, she smiled again as she opened her purse and took out a pencil, let us put it down to a woman's insatiable curiosity, if you like, and decode it together. Decode it? The twisted smile that came to his lips was genuine enough. He couldn't decode it. He had only one card to play, a flat and unequivocal refusal. 
Nothing doing, he snarled. Oh, yes, I think there is, she said softly again. He stared at her. Her pencil was flying across the paper. Who was this woman? She knew the key. Was there anything that she did not know? He watched her in a stunned way, his mind in confusion, and then he leaned forward to observe her work more closely. It is so simple, Bundy, she murmured caustically. The numerals to designate the number of letters in the words, the transposition of A for B, and so on, and the words spelled backward. It is so simple, Bundy, that it is strange you should have forgotten, and forgotten that there are other secrets I have found out in that den of yours, apart from that very convenient and ingenious door. She was working as she spoke, paying no attention to him. He made no reply, only watched her as she set down a second series of letters. A moment more, and she had written out the message in plain English. Duchy Vetter received consignment diamonds ten thousand dollars today from Amsterdam. Have information the mole is laying a plant to get them tonight between eight and nine o'clock, and divert suspicion to someone else. Run the mole to earth and make him cough up. She was studying the paper in her hand. Billy Kane lighted another cigarette. He was still watching her, but it was in a detached sort of way, between eight and nine o'clock. Peters was rarely able to leave the Ellsworth home on his evenings off until well after eight o'clock. Peters, therefore, would not reach his flat much before nine, and certainly was not likely to leave there again immediately. Billy Kane's mind was working in quick and seemingly unrelated snatches of thought. There was time enough to see this Vetter game through without interfering with that interview he meant to hold with Peters. It was strange that it should be Vetter. Whitey Jack had spoken of Vetter. Savnak, the violin player, and Vetter. Whitey Jack said that Savnak and Vetter spent most of their evenings together at Vetter's playing Pinochle and the violin. Savnak would likely be there between eight and nine. Upon whom was it that the so-called mole intended to point suspicion? Here was the moral obligation again. He had fought that out last night. She, this woman here, was not the driving force. She only represented disaster from an entirely different source if he failed. If he stood aside with the foreknowledge of crime in his possession, he was as guilty as this mole. Perhaps he had been trying to trick his own conscience in not pressing Red Vallon for explanations. Perhaps, in a measure, he had allowed the argument that he might invite Red Vallon's suspicions to act as an excuse for evading the responsibility that his foreknowledge of crime entailed. Well, that responsibility was his now, thanks to her. He had no choice. It was likely to be the man in the mask again. And... She pushed the paper toward him. "'Perhaps you would like to destroy this, for safety's sake,' she observed complacently. He took the paper mechanically and mechanically tore it up. "'I do not know the mole personally,' she was speaking almost more to herself than to him, as though feeling her way cautiously along a tortuous mental path. "'I only know him as an exceedingly clever scoundrel, and as the head of a small but very select band of criminals.' He is a sort of competitor of yours, I believe, and more than once has had the temerity to act as a thorn in the side of your own rapacious and diabolical crime trust. But I do know that this better is an honest old man. It would be too bad. Her voice, still low, was suddenly vibrant with a significance that there was no mistaking. If better should lose his diamonds, wouldn't it, Bundy? The spiral of cigarette smoke again occupied Billy Kane. It was quite true that his mind was already made up, but for the moment he was the rat, and the rat would not be likely to accede to her suggestion with any overwhelming degree of complacency. "'You are a little inconsistent, aren't you?' he inquired sarcastically. "'If you are so anxious to prevent the crime, why don't you warn the police?' "'You can put down my inconsistency to the frailty of my sex again, if you like,' she answered quickly. "'But you know quite well why. "'And besides, one Bundy Morgan, having more at stake than the police, "'is more likely to accomplish the task successfully. "'Yes, 
Bundy. But this isn't my hunt, he protested with a snarl. I can't stop all the crimes of the world. This isn't my crowd. I'm not responsible for them all. I don't know his plans. How can I put the crimp in them? The game is to let them all go ahead, isn't it? And then Red Valen is to grab the chestnuts out of the mole's pocket. Well, that's all right. But suppose I butt in, and knowing nothing about the mole's plan, fall down and he gets away with the goods and is too sharp for Red Valen, so that I can't even get the loot away from Red. Am I responsible? I'm not unreasonable, she said and smiled. There is a good deal of truth in what you say. But there is a way to provide against both contingencies. The snarl was still in his voice. What is it? he demanded. Steal the diamonds yourself before the mole gets to work, she proposed calmly. Billy Kane's gasp was wholly genuine. What? he ejaculated. You've plenty of time, she said sweetly. Vetter's isn't far from here, and it's not much more than half past seven now. The diamonds can be returned to Vetter tomorrow. After having had them stolen once, I think Vetter could be trusted to put them somewhere where neither the mole nor anyone else would be likely to succeed a second time. But I don't know where the diamonds are now. His voice was helpless in spite of himself. She lifted her shoulders. Neither do I, she said imperturbably. Well, you've got your nerve, he burst out, and it was Billy Kane, not the rat, who spoke. The interview, as far as she was concerned, was evidently at an end. She had resumed her frugal meal, and was picking daintily at the sandwich on her plate. Her eyebrows arched. "'I hope you've got yours,' she murmured. He stood up. He could have laughed ironically, and likewise he could have sworn. She was distractingly pretty, as she sat there, quite the mistress of herself, but her profound and utter disregard as to how the perilous project might result for him personally brought suddenly a vicious sweep of anger upon him. And abruptly, without a word, he swung from the table and made his way toward the door. But the few steps cleared his brain a little, brought things into sharper focus. After all, he had forgotten. To her, he was the rat, and the rat, he did not question it, merited little of either mercy or consideration at her hands. At the door he looked back. She nodded to him pleasantly and smiled, not in the manner of one who might uh, very well be sending another to his death. "'Well, I'll be damned,' muttered Billy Kane, and, opening the door, stepped out to the street. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Doors of the Night by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 The Robbery. It was not far to Vetter's place, but Billy Kane looked at his watch under a street lamp. It was later than she had said. It was ten minutes of eight. He knew where Vetter's was. That point presented no difficulties. He could hardly have spent the months he had amongst the queer, heterogeneous lives of the East Side without knowing at least that much about so outstanding a character as the old Holland diamond merchant. But that was quite another matter from knowing where the old Hollander domiciled his diamonds. Billy Kane frowned as he went along. Well, was it necessary to steal the diamonds? That task on the face of it was so almost practically impossible as to render it bizarre. He had nothing to work on, no information, just the cool suggestion that he should steal the diamonds first. And under ordinary circumstances he might well be filled with dismay at the prospect of failure in view of the threat which she held over his head, though that side of it need not and did not concern him tonight. In a few hours from now he no longer expected to be the rat. In a few hours Peters would have had his choice between losing his life and telling the truth, and under those conditions there was very little room for doubt but that Peters would have told the truth. If, however, he could meanwhile save the old Hollander from loss, he, Billy Kane, was quite ready to go to almost any length to do so. He went on at a quick pace, traversing block after block. He smiled ironically to himself as he finally turned a corner and with more caution now approached a low frame building that was bordered by a dark and narrow lane. Yes, it was bizarre enough. 
He could not very well inform the police himself. The Rat, and particularly Billy Kane, was not at the moment on speaking terms with the police. But was it necessary to steal the diamonds? Her idea, of course, was that then they would be absolutely safe from any attempt, or perhaps what she feared most, physical coercion on the part of the Mole, even if Vetter were given a warning. But surely Vetter could take care of himself if he were warned. He, Billy Kane, certainly preferred that method. But even that, as an alternative, was not quite so simple as it appeared. He was still the rat. He did not know the plan this so-called mole had evolved, and, more vital still, he did not know how closely Red Vallon was, in turn, watching the mole. It was eight o'clock now, and any or all of them might already be here. If he, Billy Kane, were discovered, there would never be that little interview with Peters. The corollary was self-evident. Even for the purpose of warning the man to reach Vetter inside the house here that he was just passing demanded the same degree of caution and secrecy on his part as though he entered for the purpose of stealing the stones himself. Also, the little shop that made the front of the building was closed and dark. Vetter's living quarters, he had heard, which was one of the eccentricities that had made the man a talked-of character on the east side, consisted of no more than a single room serving for every purpose, at the rear of the shop itself. He did not dare take the risk of inviting attention by rapping and bringing the old Hollander to the door. He turned, and, retracing his steps, sauntered nonchalantly along, passed by the house again, and slipped into the lane. Circumstances, as he found them, alone could govern his actions. Billy Kane took stock now of the surroundings. The frame building was an old affair, and the floors, therefore, would be outrageously creaky. Billy Kane scowled. The prospect of creaky floors and protesting boards was not a pleasant one. And then the scowl vanished, and a smile flickered across his lips. From somewhere at the back of the house there came suddenly the throbbing notes of a violin. The smile broadened. That was Savnak, doubtless, and, for the moment at least, it was the violin, rather than pinochle, that was engaging the two men. Personally, under the circumstances, he, Billy Kane, was very much in favor of the violin. The violin would help a good deal, if it became a question of creaky floors. He moved silently forward, now farther into the lane, keeping close to the wall in the darker shadows of the house. The old Hollander and his crony were obviously in the back room. He glanced sharply up and down the length of the building. He could see nothing. It was intensely dark. The wall of the house was blank. There were no windows opening on the lane. An expression, grimly quizzical, settled on his face. It was a queer setting for a robbery, this unpretentious, even tumble-down little shop with its back-room living quarters. But the unpretentiousness of the old Hollander's surroundings in no way argued poverty. He had known of Vetter by reputation, quite apart even from any connection with the East Side. The man had a clientele among the best in the city. He was an authority on diamonds. He dealt only in the choicest stones, and he was absolutely reliable and honest. The world of fashion had made a path to Vetter's door, not he to theirs. In this ten-thousand-dollar consignment, for instance, there would probably not be more than fifty or sixty stones— not enough to make a small handful, but not one of them probably would be worth less than a hundred dollars, and most of them would be worth a great deal more. Billy Kane reached the end of the building and found that a board fence, some seven or eight feet high, continued on down the lane, obviously enclosing the backyard of the place. The violin throbbed on. The notes came clear and sweet, entirely unmuffled now, as though from an open window. He stood there for a moment, listening. The playing was exquisite. It was some plaintive, haunting melody given life by a master touch. He remembered Whitey Jack's description of the expatriated musician. Without question, Savnak could fiddle. The man, in spite of having come a moral cropper, was, if he, Billy Kane, were any judge, little short of a genius. Glancing sharply about him once more, Billy Kane, with a lithe spring, caught the top of the fence and drew himself cautiously up until he could peer over. 
He hung there motionless for a moment. A few yards away from him, in a slightly diagonal direction, and between himself and the back door, was the window of the rear room, and, as he had suspected, the window was open. He could see inside, that is, in a restricted sense. A man, it was Savnak, of course, chin on his violin, standing, was swaying gently to and fro on his feet to the tempo of the music, his back to the window, and at the table, side-faced to the window, but with his back toward Billy Kane, Vetter, the old Hollander, white-haired, sat rapt in attention, staring at the violinist. Billy Kane drew himself further up and straddled the fence. The position of the two men rendered him safe from observation. The notes of the violin in a tremolo died softly away. The old Hollander dug his knuckles across his eyes, and his words, spoken in perfect English, evidently the language common to the two men of diverse nationalities, reached Billy Kane distinctly. "'You are wonderful, my old friend Savnak. It is divine. My friend, you are wonderful.' The violinist shrugged his shoulders. Once, he said, I could really play. Yes, I tell you, you who will believe me, that I could sway the people, that I could do with them as I would, that I... He stopped abruptly and shrugged his shoulders again. But what is the use of memories? <laughs> memories, they are bad. They leave a bad taste. Let us forget them. You were to show me the great purchase that arrived today. These... The old Hollander took from his pocket what looked like a soft, pliable, chamois-skin pocket-book, which he opened and laid on the table, disclosing a cluster of gems that, nesting on a snowy bed of wadding, sparkled and scintillated as the rays of the gas-jet above the table fell upon them. And then, impulsively closing the pocket-book again, he pushed it a little away from him. Uh, "'They can wait,' he said. "'By and by we will look at them one by one.' But they do not feed the soul, my Savnak, like your music. Play some more. They are not worth one of your notes. Are they not? Savnak's voice seemed tinged with bitterness. The soul may be well fed better, but that does not keep one often enough from tightening the belt. I think I would be fortunate to make the exchange, my gift such as it is, for your diamonds. Oh, you do not mean what you say, the old Hollander replied, shaking his head reprovingly. I know better, but I do not like to hear you talk like that. Things are not so bad with you now. You are moody. Play some more, my friend. As you will. Again Savnak shrugged his shoulders. He nestled his chin on the violin. It will be something gay, then, and lively, ah, huh, Vetter, to chase the blue devils away. The notes of the violin rose again. Billy Kane began to lower himself from the fence into the backyard. His mind was made up now. Since there were two of them there, a warning surely was all that was necessary. The window was not much more than shoulder-high from the ground, and he had, then, only to cross the yard and call to Vetter through the window. His appearance there would no doubt startle and alarm the old Hollander half out of his wits, but that was exactly what would cause the man to guard his diamonds all the more zealously for the rest of the night. Once warned, the two men in there between them ought certainly to be able to take care of themselves and that chamois pocket-book. Billy Kane dropped softly to the ground, straightened up, took a step forward, and stopped as though rooted to the spot. There had come a cry from Vetter. The violin broke off with a jerky, high-pitched, screaming note. Then silence. Billy Kane raised himself on tiptoes. He could just see in through the window no more. It seemed like some picture flashed on a cinema screen, quick, instantaneous. A third man, hat drawn far over his face, was standing by the table, covering Vetter and Savnak with a revolver. The man snatched up the chamois pocket-book, reached above his head, turned out the gas, and the room and window were in blackness. It had happened with the suddenness and swiftness of a lightning flash, so quick that the brain stumbled a little in a dazed way in an effort to grasp its significance. And then Billy Kane wrenched his automatic from his pocket. The thief, 
when or in whatever way he had got into the house, must necessarily make his escape either by the front door or by the back door and through the yard here. If it were the latter, which seemed the more likely, he, Billy Kane, had the man at his mercy. If it were the former, the man would probably reach the street in any case before he, Billy Kane, could get over the fence and rush down the lane. Billy Kane was moving swiftly in the direction of the back door. He had to choose one way or the other. He could not attempt to guard both exits at the same time. If the man Vetter's voice rose in a furious cry from the room, "'It is by the front, Savnak! He, he has gone! Quick! I hear him going out! Quick! The street! He has gone! Quick! The street!' Savnak, like a parrot in a shrill hysterical voice, was echoing the other's words. "'Quick! Chase him! And shout for the police!' A chair fell over. The two men were evidently floundering their way to the door. Curse him for turning out the light! Billy Kane whirled and dashed for the fence. As he straddled the top, he saw a figure thrown into relief on the lighted street, speed past the head of the lane, and then with a wry smile at a sudden realization of his own impotence. He dropped to the lane, and instead of running now, made his way slowly and cautiously forward, hugged close against the wall. If he ran out of the lane into the arms of Vetter and Savnak, besides hampering the pursuits by distracting their attention from the fugitive, he invited the decidedly awkward and very natural suspicion of being connected with the thief himself, and the police would be very apt to listen with their tongues in their cheeks to any explanation that the rat might offer to account for his presence in the lane at that particular moment. And if there was any one thing that he wished to avoid tonight, it was a complication with the police that would inevitably interfere with his freedom of action during the next few hours. Came a wild cry now from both Vetter and Savnak from the front of the house, and then the two men, yelling at the top of their voices, both hatless, Savnak apparently unconscious in his excitement that he was brandishing his violin frantically in one hand and his bow in the other, tore madly down the street in pursuit of their quarry. Billy Kane slipped out to the street. Doors of tenements and houses were beginning to open, heads were beginning to be thrust out through upper windows, the street was beginning to assume a state of pandemonium. A block down, the quarry, well in the lead of old Hollander and the violinist, leaped suddenly into a waiting automobile and vanished around the corner. Billy Kane turned away. He felt a curiously chagrined resentment against this so-called mole, that was quite apart from his angry resentment of the fact that the old Hollander had been victimized. He had expected something quite different from the Mole. Red Vallon, and she, too, had given the Mole a reputation for cleverness, craft, and cunning. But instead of having shown any cleverness or even a shred of originality, the Mole, or his minion, had perpetrated nothing more than a bald, crude theft that any housebreaker or broken-down old lag could have pulled off with an equal lack of finesse. Well, anyway, for the moment, so far as he was concerned, the affair was at an end, and he could only await developments. It all hinged on Red Vallon now, on Red Vallon, who proposed in turn to rob the robber, on Red Vallon, who later on would keep an appointment with him, Billy Kane, in the Rat's Den. As he turned a corner, Billy Kane consulted his watch. It was still early, just a trifle after eight. Too early for that interview with Peters yet. He might as well go back to two-finger taskers then. It was scarcely likely that she was still there, but if she were, so much the better. She could hardly hold him responsible for failure, and in any case she would realize that there was still a chance of recovering the stones by, in turn again, outwitting Red Vallon if the gangster had been successful. If she were not there, two-fingered taskers was as good a place as any in which to put in the time. He reached the dance hall and found, as he had expected, that she had already gone. He sat down at a table, ordered something from the waiter, and apparently absorbed in the dancers, who had now begun to gather, he made a sort of grimly reassuring inventory of his equipment for the night's work that still lay ahead of him. His mask his automatic. Whitey Jack's skeleton keys were in his pockets. His lips twisted in a curious smile. <laughs> the mole, Vetter, the diamonds, the old violinist, all these seemed suddenly extraneous, incidents thrust upon him, dragged irrelevantly into his existence. 
They sank into inconsequential obtrusions in the face of the stake for which he was now about to play. His freedom. A clean name again. The end of this devil's tormenting masquerade. His life, or perhaps another man's life. Peter's? Half an hour passed. Once more he looked at his watch. A few minutes later he consulted it again. And then, at a quarter to nine, he rose from the table and left Two-Finger Tasker's resort. End of chapter 14